evening, everyone, and welcome to the Wednesday, May 11th, 2022, 5 p.m. regular meeting of the Board of Selectmen. We are, remain virtual as the COVID numbers just are not in our favor yet. Um, I will call the roll of the Board of Selectmen first. Um, Joe Crisco. Here. Beth Heller here. Paul Kyriakos. Here. David Lober. Here. Shayla McCreven. Here. And David Vogel. Here. Thank you. Uh, Administrative Officer, Director of Finance, Tony Genovese. Here. Assistant Administrative Officer, Betsy Agla. Here. Town Council, Gerald T. Weiner. Here. Here. And um, our clerk, Geraldine Shaw, is here. And our media specialist is tuning in from another place, who afford is taping this meeting for, for, uh, for everyone to watch at home and for safety and also to uh, have for everyone to watch on Channel 79 and we'll get, and also YouTube at some point. So all of that. Again, a reminder, I've been asked to do, remind all the board of selectmen to please go in and sign the call of the annual town meeting. I promised you to do that. And uh, let's see, I've got, she's got notes here for me. Um, I guess that's everything for now. She'll keep me honest if I forgot something. So item one on the agenda is the first selectman's remarks. Um, again, good evening and welcome to the May 11th Board of Selectmen regular meeting. Late last month, Governor Lamont, followed, following an approved proposal from the state legislator, legislature, sorry, signed new legislation into law, allowing the continuation of remote meetings past the original deadline of April 30th. Board of commissions may choose to meet in person or remotely. I'm so pleased that especially now when the COVID-19 positivity rate is very high, we have the ability to be flexible and meet virtually when it is prudent to do so. The positivity rate today is now 13.01. I will remind everyone here this evening and those joining us remotely that the annual town meeting will be held on Monday, May 16th at 7.30 p.m. in the Amity Regional High School Brady Auditorium. There is very little ventilation in our center building gymnasium and it is not safe to hold large and lengthy gatherings in that space. I thank Amity for accommodating us. At that meeting, the Board of Finance will present its final proposed budget to the public. The procedure for the meeting will be as follows. Voter check-in will begin at 6 p.m. and end, end at 8 p.m. All voters must check in with the registrar's voter so that the registrars may determine the number of eligible voting voters at the meeting. The town charter requires a minimum of 250 voters present and voting to increase, decrease, or eliminate a line item. The recommended preliminary budget summary was previously mailed to all households. And you may view the version with line item detail on the finance department which webpage, along with a recording of April 18th, 2022 preliminary budget hearing presentation and the town's new interactive online budget tool. The call and agenda for tonight's meeting was also mailed to every household. I will remind everyone that based on our town charter, only line items can be increased, decreased, or eliminated. Each line item motion must have a minimum of 250 voters present and voting, and at least 60% of those present and voting is required to increase, decrease, or eliminate a budget line item. There cannot be a vote on the overall budget, as again, the town charter limit, limits votes to line items only. We received word from the TPNZ Commission that at their last meeting, they approved the A24 request for installation of the Regional Water Authority water line from Beecher Road to the dog park. Regarding the Agricultural Commission's continuing, continued request that the Board of Selectmen approve five year leases on the town owned fields that are currently leased on a yearly basis. Having a five year lease would allow farmers to apply for farming state grants. I believe it is impractical to tie up town land for five years. We tried to add a protection for the town in the draft of a five-year lease, stating that we would grant a five-year lease, but the town would at any time be able to revoke the lease if for some reason the town needed use of the land. That language was unacceptable to the state. I asked our Board of Selectmen liaison, Paul Curiecoast, to ask the Agricultural Commission to research how other towns in Connecticut handle this so that hopefully we can somehow help the farmers and also protect the town in, in case. In an extraordinary situation, we would need the land. Again, 
Five-year leases would eliminate the town's flexibility to deal with publicly owned property. In addition, Attorney Weiner advised that not only does the state require a five-year unconditional lease, they may also require an additional five-year option, which would tie up the property for 10 years. I have an update on the two, on two new building committees. Getting the state grants for projects has been wonderful, but it also requires new committees to move forward. First, the membership of the Woodbridge Community Center Building Committee shall be architect Bob Tucker, former selectman Sandy Stein, who has agreed to serve as chair of this committee, and current Recreation Commission Chair Andrea Weinstein. Tony Genovese, or his designee, will serve as the staff representative. The committee will work with the, this is their charge, the committee will work with the town's chosen architect to finalize plans and designs and select a contractor for the conversion of the old firehouse into a community center. The committee shall apply best practices for sustainable design, including the use of sustainable and energy efficient products and materials, LEED certification if applicable, and the possible use of green energy and other techniques and seek grant opportunities to fund or offset the additional potential cost of these initiatives. Upon approval of the Woodbridge Board of Selectmen of the construction design plan, the committee shall seek bids on all aspects of the construction in accordance with the Town of Woodbridge purchasing policy and state grant requirements. The committee shall recommend to the Woodbridge Board of Selectmen the selection of one or more firms to perform the construction after receipt and review of the bids. The committee shall also oversee construction of the proposed project. Secondly, as a reminder, the membership of the Center Building Committee Renovation Committee, which I announced last month, is Dr. Police Chief Frank Capiello, Police Commissioner Andy Esposito, Human Services Director Jeanette Glixman, Selectman Paul Kirikos, and Board of Finance Member Dwight Rowland, who will also serve as chair. Janice Inocenzi will serve, will staff the committee. The committee will work to plan, design, construct, and finance upgrades to convert the center building into a modern police department space for offices, classrooms, and programs. The committee shall apply best practices for sustainable design, including the use of sustainable and energy efficient products and materials, LEED certification if applicable, and the possible use of green energy and other techniques and seek grant opportunities to fund or offset the additional potential costs of these initiatives. The committee shall work to identify funding sources for the project, including state and federal grants. Upon approval of the Woodbridge Board of Selectmen of the Construction Design Plan, the committee shall seek bids on all aspects of the construction in accordance with the Town of Woodbridge purchasing policy. The committee shall recommend to the Woodbridge Board of Selectmen the selection of one or more firms to perform the construction after receipt and review of the bids. The committee shall also oversee construction of the proposed project. Since our last meeting, we were joined by Governor Ned Lamont, State Senator George Cabrera, and State Representative Mary Lelander for an outdoor press conference in front of the old firehouse to announce the $2 million grant we received to convert the building into a new community center. That evening, we held a preliminary budget hearing at the new firehouse. On April 29th, Tony Betsy and I met with Lou Mangini from U.S. Representative Rosa DeLauro's office. For almost three years, I have been seeking funding for an Army Corps of Engineers feasibility study of the West River and Canoles Pond. There is, there's a very lengthy process involved. Step one, it is my understanding that before we seek funding for the feasibility study, the Army Corps of Engineers must gather some preliminary data, which actually should begin soon. Step two, we must then apply for funding for the feasibility study, which the cost will be determined by the preliminary data. Step three, once the feasibility study is completed, then we must apply for federal funding to finally fix the longstanding flooding issue, issues in the area. This has been quite frustrating for me and of course the residents in the area as we navigate all these steps. I've been working on this issue since 2019 and so have my predecessors. I have remained hopeful that something <coughs> will begin this year. Tony Betsy, EDC Chair Robert Scherer and I met with Rich Horgan, CEO of a Boston-based company looking to move to Woodbridge into the old Bayer building on Research Drive. They have a very interesting company. It is a nonprofit biotech seeking federal and state fundings for drug development of personalized gene therapy for rare diseases through an interdisciplinary collaboration with world-known researchers and clinicians to save lives. 
I attended the Woodbridge Board of Education meeting where I delivered a proclamation for Teacher and Staff Appreciation Week. I also met with Fire Chief Sean Rowland, Tony and David Archite and architect David Stein to begin discussions of the fire department's storage facility and the old firehouse community center. Zoning Enforcement Officer Chris Sullivan, Light Officer Mike Martinsky, and I met with neighbors from Cedar Rock Terrace about a zoning blight of concern. Thanks to absolutely gorgeous weather, I attended the annual Earth Day event on Saturday, April 23rd, and I read our proclamation announcing a pollinator pathway in town. Additionally, related to saving our Earth, Public Works Director Warren Connors, Betsy, and I met with resident Dr. Yeji Song, who is a professor at the Yale School of Forestry who is working on ways to help residents think globally and act lo locally regarding climate change. On April 29th, I met with Superintendent Dr. Jen Byers and First Selectman Jim Zioli and Paula Co-Francesco for our monthly meeting. First Selectman Co-Francesco and I read a proclamation celebrating the 50th anniversary of Bethwood Baseball at their annual opening day on April 30th. As you now know, the Amity budget referendum on May 3rd was defeated in all three towns. My understanding is the district will be meeting to vote, and I believe they voted last evening, to vote on another proposed referendum date, which will now be May 24th. On Thursday, May 5th, I attended the National Day of Prayer celebration for Woodbridge at the Trinity Evangelical Lutheran Church and read the governor's proclamation. I also went to the Beach Road School Ice Cream so Social later that evening. I'm sure by now you have heard that Woodbridge Superintendent Dr. Jonathan Budd has accepted another position in another district and will be leaving Beecher Road School as of June 30th, I believe. We wish him all the best in his new role. And as a segue to item two on the agenda, I will now introduce Dr. Bud for the superintendent's update. There he is. <laughs> Thank good, you very much, Pat. Good evening, Jonathan. I've, seen you, I've seen you twice today. That's right, exactly, exactly. Well, I don't know, I don't, maybe you could just give a quick update on that meeting as well, if you don't mind, because I didn't, I didn't do so. Thank you. Sure, thank you everyone for your time. So I do want to update you on this morning's special meeting of the Woodbridge Board of Ed. Uh, based on a motion that the board had made in February, because the New Haven County COVID-19 community level has risen to high, the board convened a special meeting today to hear specific data related to the town of Woodbridge and Beecher Road School and the administrative team's approach to mitigation strategies. Uh, I'm pleased to report the board endorsed our approach, which has included a wide range of mitigation strategies since COVID began over two years ago. Uh, most of those mitigation strategies have sunsetted by this point, uh, including mandatory masking. We, we still continue mask choice, uh, but we're continuing other key strategies, uh, such as reduced capacity in our school cafeteria and three foot social distancing between individuals in our classrooms. Uh, and before I go into this final topic, I have to say, Beth, you and I didn't speak at all about our remarks, but my remarks are almost an underlining of your remarks because I'm gonna mention that last week was Teacher Appreciation Week nationwide, and it was celebrated in a variety of ways here, including First Selectman Heller's reading of a proclamation at our board meeting. Uh, just last night, I was privileged to accompany our Woodbridge Teacher of the Year, wonderful grade two teacher, Joseph De Palma, to a statewide recognition ceremony at the Bushnell in Hartford. And uh, <laughs> Governor Lamont also spoke there. But <laughs> so uh, another underlining, connecting our remarks. But in addition to recognizing the wonderful work of our teachers this month, we also recognize the vital roles played by all our staff in a variety of ways, from our paraeducators to our custodians, from our administrative assistants to our nurses, from our food services employees to our administrators, each additional, each adult member of our community is as important as each child member of our community. And so it's important for me, like it was for Beth, to call that to your attention tonight. Uh, my staff and I look forward to seeing you Monday night at the town meeting. And as always, thank you very much for your ongoing support of the district. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, anyone have any comments or questions for Dr. Budd? Okay, thank you so much. I will see you Monday. Take care, stay safe.
And item three on the agenda, um, archaeology proposal from um, regarding Bladens River and uh, Dr. S uh, Scarlotta. He has been with us several times. Unfortunately, he is not able to attend this evening, so we will um, hold that agenda item off until he's able to join us. Item four on the agenda is the um, scheduling a Board of Selectmen special meeting for discussion of the Woodbridge Affordable Housing Plan final draft. Proposed time and date. Um, we received the 96 page document on Monday morning and uh, sent it out to you guys Monday with the final agenda. And I personally did not have time yet to get through the 96 pages and I thought it would be inappropriate to have a discussion on this most important document with only 36 hours or so to review it, maybe 48 total. But um, I, I would propose that we have a special meeting. We always save the second, uh, I'm sorry, the fourth Wednesday of the month for a, a, in any business that we can't complete. So I would propose, and we put it on the agenda, hoping so you'd be able to check your calendars prior to tonight to see if, um, does anyone have any conflicts on the, that evening? Sounds good. So we will, um, I don't think we need a motion because it's already sort of a <clears throat> on time. So we will have our second uh, meeting of the month this month on Wednesday, May 25th, 2022 at 5 p.m. to uh, review and uh, have a discussion on the um, Woodbridge Affordable Housing Plan, the draft that we received from the committee. So with that, we'll move on. So minute, would that be virtual or in or at town hall? Yeah, if the, if, if the rate goes down, if we have, yeah, I, I doubt it will be uh, in person, Joe. But we will probably have public comment on that meeting as well. I'm, I'm not sure. I haven't gotten that far yet. Joe, uh, David, sorry. Yeah, I've, got, I've got my 96 page uh, <laughs> PDF also. Is this online yet? Is it public or is it just still in house? It's a good question. I do not know. Uh, excuse me, this is Jerry. I do have paper copies for anyone who wants them. And when you come in to sign the um, the call, I'll be happy to give you one. Are, are you asking about having it being uh, part of, you know, for folks to read? Perhaps we could put it up. Jerry, it's a draft. It could still go up though, right? It, it could still be online. It could go online. It should be public for people to read before the public. I agree. Okay, yeah. perfect. As long as I just want to make sure it was okay, because it's sometimes a draft you can't. I don't understand the legal stuff sometimes. So uh, I'm Jerry, just curious. Thank you for that. Thank you for answering that. Yep. And um, I think it would be helpful. If Jerry, maybe Jerry Shaw, maybe you could ask uh, Chris to put it up tomorrow. We could probably get it up as well or a link or something. Maybe Betsy. We'll take care of that. Betsy will take care of that. Somebody do something. I don't know how to do that. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, here it well, it's only 518 and we're up to public comment. So I think we'll wait till six as we always do. So with that, we will begin liaison reports. Uh, David Vogel. And I, oh, I would ask everybody, I'm gonna mute as well. Just please mute yourself if you're not speaking so we don't have background noise for folks that are speaking. Thank you. I, I'm first, am I? Well, okay. Yes, sir. <laughs> uh, you want, want us to come back to you? I don't wanna make it hard. <laughs> could you please, because I just, I, uh, somewhere okay. I've misplaced it. I'm, I don't want to waste your time looking. Well, for let me that. forget you. Okay, D Sheila McCrevin. Don't forget me. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Beth, you're keeping us on our toes tonight. So I have a, a quick liaison report. So the uh, Board of Education met on April 19th for their regular meeting, but I was unable to attend. I was out of state and I did not have a reliable internet connection. That is the meeting that Beth mentioned she did attend, though, um, virtually, I believe. Um, they, uh, Woodbridge Board of Ed has also had two special meetings. So they had one on May 11th, which was all in executive session with regard to collective bargaining negotiations and prospective transportation contracts. And because they're contracts, that's done in executive session. And then again, as Beth mentioned, they met this morning at 7 a.m. to review their COVID-19 data and their mitigation strategies. So the other thing that I would note is that kindergarten registration is open and they have a notice at their website, uh, but I would also urge anyone who's got a potential kindergartner out there who has not been in touch yet, maybe doesn't know about this, that they should visit the um, website for the school district, which is woodbridge.ct, uh, actually woodbridgek12.ct.us. Um, and it's been that 
that same address since the beginning of internet time, it seems. Um, then I also attended the Coupop meeting and they met on April 25th and I provided an update there for a recent action that we took as the Board of Selectmen with regard to um, just hearing from our ordinance subcommittee on two matters that were relevant to Coupop. Um, Coupop is, I'm sorry, was someone speaking? Sorry. Um, so Coupop is also discussing potential future agenda items for Coupop to handle. Um, the chairman there, Nicole Donzello, has done a very thorough review of the plan of conservation and development, and she is seeking some follow-up information from town hall staff. I know that there's, a, I think, a meeting scheduled later in the week for that. And then at their next meeting, Coupop wants to talk about how they might be best helpful on the various uh, items that might come before them. So that's an update from those two boards. That's it. Thank you very much. Uh, David Vogel, are you ready yet? Sure, I'll give it a go. Yep. Uh, yeah, the uh, you, library commission met yesterday. Your screen is off, David. I don't know if you want to pop it back on or not. There you are, okay. I think you're muted. Oops, I'm sorry. Thought it was me. Muted. I seem to be at a lot. I'm I'm lost today. I apologize. Uh, you can all hear me. Good. Uh, the uh, library commission met yesterday, and uh, as you all know, because it's in our agenda, uh, Jim Moriarty has uh, moved out of town. Is going to have to leave as the chair. That's a that's a loss for us as a town. He did an exemplary job, uh, and but he was there as an as a uh, uh, consultant to the committee commission because that's what they had invited him to do. Uh, they did table the agenda of electing a new secretary because their secretary Tom has been named inter interim chair to handle that responsibility and until they can have an election for a new chair. And then it gets complicated in the bylaws. So they, they simply have tabled the issue of, of electing a new secretary, uh, and that m may not be necessary. Uh, we did have, uh, you know, the, the public comments and reports. Most of the committee meetings were about the expenditures of money that has happened so far, and they discussed how the uh, library friends had had uh, contributed to purchasing part of the uh, screen that was used at our finance meeting, I believe, and they are looking forward to using that for their purposes to uh, for the programs that they run in the summer, like the movies on the green and, and so forth. Uh, I also discussed some of the things that come up in their budget, like the hoopla cost, which went up a lot during COVID. That's the, uh, that's the online book, uh, borrowing capacity that we have to pay for and uh so eric said that he's able to work the budget so that it it all works but that we can probably expect that hoopla will be very popular even now going forward uh there was a discussion about the possibility of a, of uh, some surplus in their budget at the end of the year and uh I think Tony will say more about that in his report. The uh, in new business, the most one of the most interesting parts of their committee of the commission meeting was uh, some looking into things that have been done by Dick Blackwell and, and Eric Worthman uh, toward creating a public relations ad hoc committee for the library, and they've discovered through some of their uh, simple ad hoc kind of uh, surveying of random people that they could use some advertising and marketing to expand the access of the library, both online as well as uh, to some of the programs and things like their newsletter. And I think this seems to be a very productive area for them to be working in because I think it will help the resources of the library be expanded to more residents. And so uh, that seems to be moving forward well. Uh, the other thing that was discussed was the, pro the project that they've been doing, digitizing historical documents for the town of Woodbridge. 
And that's also been uh, in cooperation with what's going on in the clerk, town clerk's office. And uh, apparently, if, if you really are interested in the history, this is a very exciting, a very exciting opportunity. Uh, I also attended a recreation commission meeting and uh, we talked about the, uh, just basically about things really getting going in the, uh, in the spring. Uh, there is, uh, I think, I think not a lot that really is going to be of great importance to us because we know about the baseball anniversary. Beth has already reported on that, uh, happening. Uh, they, uh, they, we had canceled the last commission meeting, in fact, because of uh, John's mother's funeral, which happened to be on that date. So <clears throat> we were catching up on some of the things that were in the works, including the May 14th bike event. Uh, uh, Smith Mowry has uh, apparently is on the firehouse committee for renovation. I think is that not is that correct or not correct? Is that has that been taken over by? Uh, we asked him to do it, and he um, found he couldn't spare the time because of baseball with his son. Right. Okay. So at that at that meeting, yeah. they thought it was going to be that way, but it but it's evidently our chair he had to withdraw. Who, yeah. yeah. Who's there? Uh, the uh, we've got uh, the we have a uh, fitness center sponsorship for the kids triathlon for this June 11th and also for the road race. So they were reporting on how things are going as they try to get their, uh, their various events together. Uh, the, the pool report, all the, all the levels at the pool, all the learning and swimming opportunities are full. They're prepping for the summer. They're getting people off the waiting list as soon as possible. And they're trying to accommodate everyone. Uh, they hired They've had personnel approved for hiring lifeguards, so that that's going well. I would say that the highlights right now are the fitness center, pickleball, outdoor programs, all running very smoothly. Uh, going forward, they're looking for new ice skating rink possible locations. Uh, they were open 14 days this year. They hope to be able to do that more in the future. And they also have over 200 already signed up for the summer camp. The only other item there was that the budget is in fact on tack on track. So uh, the government access TV, pretty simple. Uh, we they they're engaging in a review of procedure policies and procedures. Uh, they think they may be over a bit over on budget by about nineteen hundred dollars, but they think there's money that can be repurposed to take care of that. Obviously, they've been under a great deal of uh, activity need given our our uh, you know video programming of most of our meetings and boards and 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 uh, commissions. So uh, they are really interested in internet connect internet connectivity for the firehouse renovation for one thing, and uh, they're also looking to upgrade their broadcast server. So those are sort of things that probably have something to do with capital budget or, or things that they may get grants for. Uh, and that pretty much gets all of my commissions. Sorry, I was a little disorganized. No worries, thank you. Um, let's see, now I'm disorganized. Uh, we did Sheila, okay, David Lober. Are we all muted here again? Sorry, I'll start over. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Went to the Conservation Commission meeting and they explored the possibility of grants, uh, availability and requirements of open space grants for future property acquisition. Some members will attend a seminar on May 19th on the grant writing process and report back to the full commission. The town can also apply for similar grants. The town currently has $78,000 for open space purchase. The open space plan of 2000 to 2020 describes town open space uh, section by section. Chairman Austin has developed a computer tool to categorize properties abutting open space and their ownership for possible acquisition. 
The town is working with Scrog to update the Greenway map. The current map is from 2009. Attended the Inland Wetlands Agency. There were <clears throat> a few items on there. Uh, the first was a Merritt Avenue project. The representatives for the developers for the Merritt Avenue project presented to the agency and they concluded that the project would not impact the wetlands, that maintenance of the retention basement would be done through a, an HOA, and that non-native trees and shrubs would be replaced and that there was no vernal pool. Uh, Commissioner Sosinski questioned these conclusions, noting that there would be increased runoff from newly created impermeable surfaces of roadways, driveways, and roofs. He asserted that drainage and discharge from surface flow now to retention basin and then to groundwater and the river would suffer significant disruption. The expert for the developer believed the water quality would not be affected. A public hearing will be continued on that. 49 Rimmon Road was a request to split off 1.6 acres from an existing six acre parcel, and that's gonna be continued through next month. Um, the Human Services Commission, a couple of items. Ava Schambron was selected for the first Selectman's Youth Award. Uh, <clears throat> People's Bank has generously donated a $2,000 prize for that. A budget enhancement grant of $8,758 can now be used for the after school guided study program. Other youth services activities include a home alone program, paint party, a field trip to Adventure Discovery Park, the youth evening programs sponsored by Kim Britton and Amity Middle School Bethany PTSO, and parties for the sixth and the eighth grade. Um, at the center, again, they're requiring masks because of the uptick in COVID. Uh, activities this uh, month and last month included virtual art tour of the War Wadsworth Athenaeum, I'm, not, I'm sorry, the Wadsworth Museum, spring drive through luncheon, which had 91 participants, which was sponsored by Resnick and Resnick Law Firm and the Linden, uh, armchair adventure series, parts of the West, the Woodbridge Police Department crime prevention presentation was done, and they're now having cornhole in the Grove and a senior center social. Uh, last month, they had a history of White House entertainment and a Mother's Day drive through luncheon sponsored by Visiting Angels and Ellen Park Nursing Home. Um, the commission voted to provide transportation for social visits for seniors, which was approved, uh, allowing downtime for drivers to be utilized. Um, drivers are presently paid for four hours and they don't always have four hours of work to do, so this would fill in the time. Uh, medical appointments will still be prioritized. It was also agreed to hire Michael Quick as a part-time driver. And we also have a volunteer to receive and package meals on Tuesdays, which frees up the clerical staff from this duty. Um, there is no word yet on a grant uh, approval of ARPA funds, which is applied for by the for the Agency on Aging of South Central Connecticut. <clears throat> There's a $2,880 grant for Tai Jake Kwan Better Balance Program, and that was approved. And a human services, um, <clears throat> the program and offers included mask and test kit distribution, 160 kits and 80 adult masks and 50 child's masks were um, distributed. Uh, they are having an Ask the Pharmacist program on June 9th. Uh, they have pop-up COVID vaccinations, 80, um, and they administered 80 vaccinations to seniors and to also town employees. They had tax assistance to 225 people, and they will continue with the Living Treasure Award and a volunteer appreciation event. And that's all I have. Thank you. Uh, moving on, let's see, where are we here? Um, Paul Curie Coast. I think you got to unmute yourself, Paul. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, the Agricultural Commission met on April 27th, um, and uh, apparently there is a, a new ordinance um, that allows them uh, uh, farm allows farm stands to sell outside products. Mm. Um, uh, that ordinance may bear some discussion because it is a bit broad. Uh, it, I, I don't think it requires that 
the items be farm products. Um, as I understood it originally, it was outside products that were complementary to the farm stand. Uh, but this may be a little bit more broad than that. Um, Sorry, Paul, I think it's rather than an ordinance, I believe it's a regulation and it was something that TBZ enacted. I'm sure oh, Jeff Briscoe is going to okay. get to Thanks that. Reports, right? okay. okay. Thanks for the correction. Um, uh, also, I think you've heard the discussion on um, the leases. Um, the state requires five year leases for um, grants and so on. So we're actively looking for a solution. Chris Sorensen has uh, indicated that he'll reach out to, I think, Guilford to see what their solution is on that matter. Um, that's it for Agricultural Commission. Um, the Amity Board of Ed met this Monday, the 8th. I wasn't able to go because COVID is making the rounds in my family. Um, and that's all I have, I believe. Thank you very much. And Joe Crisco. Thank you. Uh, there was a town plan and zoning uh, meeting on Monday, May 2nd. Uh, there was a public hearing scheduled for application for amendments to the zoning regulations regarding items offered for sale at roadside stands, that is, items uh, produced on or off the, the property. Uh, there was no public comments whatsoever. In regards to uh, a new business, uh, there was a referral by the town of Woodbridge in regards to the Fitzgerald property, uh, 100 Center Road installation of a water line from Beecher Road to the dog park on the Fitzgerald property. Uh, the um, commission also agreed to look at uh, the feasibility of uh, establishing the solar farm. Under the work session, uh, as I mentioned, uh, the application for amendments to the zoning regulations regarding items offered for sale at roadside stands was approved. There was discussion with planner Glenn Chowder regarding the scope of his work on cleaning up the current zoning regulations, including getting them into one cohesive document that is word searchable and that is an ongoing process. Um, there was a discussion and appropriate action taken regarding zoning regulations, addressing recreation cannabis retailers, including holding of a form on cannabis, which was held uh, last night, uh, May 10th. And then uh, there was no further action. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, it's still not six o'clock. We can continue on. Um, the next item, item seven on our agenda is the Neighborhood Assistance Act applications. We receive them and action is appropriate. And for those new to the board, um, action appropriate requires that on both of these, there's one from the Amity Teen Center. We, they renew them every year. And then there's another one from the Jewish Community Center. And we are required to have a public hearing, which we usually schedule during our uh, regular board of selectmen meetings. So I will make a motion that the action be that we um, schedule a public hearing for our next meeting, which I believe is June 8th. And I will propose 6.30 PM, which is when we, time we usually do. We can work it out, but I'll make that motion. Is there a second? Okay. Thank you, Joe. Any discussion or questions on this? Hearing none, I'll call the roll. Joe Crisco? Yes. Beth Heller, yes. Paul Kirikos? Yes. Uh, David Lover? Aye. Sheila McCreven? Aye. And David Vogel? Aye. Thank you very much. Um, next item on our agenda is healthcare renewal with Brian Luciani. I don't know if he's available yet or we'll have to uh, zip to here. something. Else. Yes, he's here uh, for your guest. Wonderful. Thank you. Great. I just got unmuted. Hi, Beth. Hi. How are you, Brian? I'm good. Thank you. Good. Good to be with you virtually, but good to have you with us this evening. Happy to be here. Um, <laughs> For a change, I have nothing but good news to report. <laughs> and that is due to a, a real change in our claim results. We were much, much better this year than the past three years. And the competitive bidding process, which brought in Aetna, United Healthcare, Cigna, uh, as well as um, Blue Cross, 
we were able to get the renewal from Connecticut to a zero increase for the town and the board, a zero increase on the dental from Blue Cross, a zero increase on the vision from Blue Cross, and a, a net savings of $8,200 by bidding out the group life, which didn't change this year, but the market has gotten soft. And um, we were able to match the contract, get a three-year rate guarantee, and save $8,200 a year on a really a pretty vanilla item. Where we can't argue with zeros. Great report. Oh, we have <laughs> zero in 15 years. Wow, it's amazing. Tony, do you have anything else to add on that? I just want to mention that uh, Brian and his team did a lot of um, hard work this uh this renewal period to get us to zero. And, um, and so we're very pleased with that and should be commended for their, um, all the work they did for us. Fabulous. Um, you need from us a motion to go forward with the, I don't have the numbers or what do you need just as described by Brian? Could I do that as a motion? It's basically to renew with uh, Connecticut, which is our current carrier. Okay. It was, with no increase as long as in the other carriers that Brian mentioned. Okay. So you're renewing with Connecticut for medical, Anthem for dental and vision, and changing to standard life for group life, accidental death and dismemberment. Sounds um, fine the way you read it. Um, I will make that motion with those descriptions. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. And any comments or discussions before we vote to approve or not? Sheila? Just a quick question. I know this uh, implicates uh, has implications for next year's budget. Tony, can you tell us just, just a quick overview of uh, uh, what that means in terms of timing? Do we make changes or we don't make changes? So we made changes at the last uh, Board of Finance meeting uh, mm -hmm. when we um, made changes for the uh, final budget. Uh, that's what the, there was an $80,000 reduction to town benefits, which reflects the fact that while well, I had budgeted, it's, it's actually not the first reduction to health care, but that was the latest um, is we were at a, at that point, a 2% two, 2 or so increase. And so when Brian was able to um, get a zero uh, increase, that was able to save us $80,000 on our benefits. So um, we are right on the, right on the budget with that. Excellent. Thank you. Okay. Anyone else? Hearing none. Uh... Joe Crisco? Aye. Beth Heller? Aye. Paul Kirikos? Aye. David Lover? Aye. Sheila McCreven? Aye. And David Vogel? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Um, Brian, thank you for all your efforts and what a wonderful job. We appreciate it very much. Thank you, Beth. Thank, thank you, Brian. You. Good night. Thank Good night. You. You're welcome to stay, but thank <laughs> you. <laughs> Get out where you can. All right. right. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Right. Are we at oh, 5.43? My goodness. Um, well, Tony, you think we can zoom through at Let's try. We'll do public comment. So, um, start my report, and then when it's 6 o'clock, I can just stop. Yeah, and, you know. or we can just, as long as we do it after 6, 6 or after, it's okay. So we'll keep, just keep going with you. Okay. Thank you. The, um, the first is a monthly report which is um, through April of 2022, the year-end surplus of just over $700,000, which leaves, um, we have an allocation of $400,000 from fund balance. So that leaves us with a, um, a projected uh, actual surplus of $325,000 to our fund balance, which would be just $7 million or 13.6%. Uh, most of the um, activity here is in revenues, uh, including a surplus in um, intergovernmental revenue of $444,000. Uh, most of that is from uh, FEMA, uh, which is $163,000 that we received a reimbursement. For, so it's a reimbursement for prior expenses from a prior fiscal year. So it's not, not necessarily a surplus um, in, to, in terms of its total um, because it, it reimburses us for expenditures from a prior year. So it's a surplus in this fiscal year. But, it, but it's actually reimbursing us for expenditures we had um, back a few years ago. So I just want to make that sort of make that point. It's more of a timing issue. Uh, we've also um, anticipated a surplus of about $250,000 in special education excess cost grant funds. 
So once again, that's a reimbursement of uh, special ed eligible special education costs that are in the Board of Education budget. So it's not necessarily a surplus in terms of uh, the town total town uh, budget, but um, it's a surplus in our half of the ledger with our revenues. Uh, we had budgeted seventy thousand dollars in the budget, so you can see it's a um, much greater than what we had budgeted for. Uh, we we still have a, a deficit in investment income, but eighty thousand dollars, and um, department charges is another area where we have a surplus that's just about two hundred thousand dollars. We've seen a, a significant increase in uh, building permit fees, uh, building permit revenues, fee revenue. That's about two hundred thousand uh, dollars. If you recall. Half of that surplus is from the work by the water company, which we were not sure when that was going to take place. And so that's a, a majority of that surplus or half that surplus, at least, but a little over half. Um, so um, so that's the um, surplus in uh, building permits. And um, we have a uh, projected surplus in transfer station fees. It's about $20,000, uh, including um, the uh, fee revenue we're starting to collect for bulky, which I'll get into in a little bit, which uh, began February 1st. So um, we had not budgeted for that when we did our budget, not unsure of when uh, that would take place. We did budget for um, estimated revenues for next year's budget. Our board of finance uh, has a short, uh, small surplus of $3,600 due to um, savings in our town audit. Um, center building is $7,000 um, surplus due to electricity savings. Um, some of that, most of that is from the um, savings when we um, had replaced some lights and we had to, um, we, we paid off uh, that over time with our savings and our bill. And uh, so those, those were paid off. And so that's where some of that savings comes into play. Uh, some of our other buildings are also, uh, for those of you who weren't on the board, uh, we took advantage of a, um, a UI program where we were able to use the savings in, a, in a lighting upgrades to pay for those upgrades and you use the savings to, so there's no impact on your budget or on your uh, on your bill and then um, eventually depending on how much your savings is it's paid off over time so anywhere from a year and a half to three years so you some of those will start to, to be paid off and uh, we shall see some significant savings in our electricity uh, the building official has a surplus of about thirty thousand dollars savings in part-time wages uh, in, in the building officials line itself, and we've had some turnover there, and um, so that's uh, some part of the reason for that. Uh, the transfer station actually should see a surplus. Uh, we were predicting possibly um, breaking even or a slight deficit in the transfer station. However, we've seen um, two things have happened interestingly in the transfer station. Uh, one is a um, uh, reduction in tonnage of bulky waste. And so um, we've seen our bulky waste tonnage go down. Um, we're tracking that, and I have a, a chart to show you later on. Um, and also, uh, we've got reduced recycling costs. So um, the way the recycling works is there's a cost to recycle our materials, but that's offset by the, um, the amount that the um, group can get. We're in a multi-town group of um, about eight or 10 towns. We all pool our recycling together and it's all sold um, through, a, it's through, it's all through contract uh, and it's a floating rate. So each commodity has a floating rate based on its, um, what, what can, can be sold for. So that sort of changes the amount we have to pay in recycling. Um, so that's, uh, we've seen that uh, our costs go down. Uh, actually what has happened is the amount for some of the uh, materials have just gone up in terms of its value. Uh, cardboard is one, and um, that's a big one that's gone up, and I think paper. Uh, human services has a, a projected surplus of $35,000. That's due to uh, wages, and uh, as does the library. Uh, I, I'd say they probably have a surplus of about thirty thirty-five thousand dollars $35,000 in their budget due to savings and wages as well. And it's, a lot of that's due to timing of programming that's come online as a result of the uh, pandemic. So. So those are all the, the um, highlights of the uh, budget. Any questions or? Okay. Okay, thank you. I know the next item under your report is funding requests. And uh, 
I think the only thing we have is a line item transfer. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Uh, that is the amount. It is uh, line. I, maybe I'll make a motion, then we can talk about it. Uh, I'll move approval of uh, line item transfer number two one two two dash fourteen in the amount of fifteen thousand dollars. It is a line item transfer in a department. There's a memo from Warren Connors in here. I believe it's from Warren. No, it's from Kelly and Warren. Uh, Tony, you just want to review it quick. It's pretty self-explanatory. Sure. The uh, so the overtime amount. If, I don't know if you recall, the last time we transferred money for overtime, we thought we were done with the snow, and then I think a few days after that, we had one final snow event, which caused some more overtime. So this should be it, uh, but that's uh, the reason for the overtime, and um, the uh, vehicle parts is just some additional maintenance. We were just short in that line, so we have some additional repairs that we need to do. Let's hope this should be it. I forgot to ask for a second for this motion. I hope so, yeah. Thank, Thank you, Joe. <laughs> Holy smokes. They're able to cover it in their own budget because of some um, some um, uh, uh, staff turnover. So there's some money, there's some savings in their part time, in their wage account. That's the good stuff. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions or comments on this? If not, um, I will call the roll. David Vogel. Aye. Sheila McCreven. Aye. David Lober. Aye. Paul Kirikos. Aye. Beth Heller. Aye. And Joe Crisco. Aye. Thank you very much. Oh, 551. We'll keep zooming here, Tony. Uh, next is uh, item C, state grant update. So I, I, I provided each of you with a chart, which um, has all of the um, operating budget uh, formulary, most of these are all mostly formulary grants that we receive that are general grants not tied to a specific project that the state uh, provides each town with in its legislative session. Um, we, we don't receive very much compared to some towns, and a lot of these are very similar to the uh, prior year and similar to what we put in our budget with one major exception. And that's the municipal transition grant. So the municipal transition grant is the grant we are receiving because the state has put a property tax cap of 32.46 mills on motor vehicles. So that means that instead of collecting 43 mills on our motor vehicles, we will collect 32.46 mills. So that leaves us with a shortfall of just under $1.3 million. Um, because we are collecting on a lower mill rate. To um, make up for that $1.3 million, the state is giving us $1 million. <laughs> so you can see there's... Perfect. So, there's, <laughs> right. so I, I did a little investigation and found that the state used our, 20, our uh, 2022 grand list to um, come up with that figure. So, of course, the two obvious problems. One is the mill rate's higher in 23. So that, 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 that's a problem. And also the values are much higher, as you probably are aware. The values went up about 20% this year because of the increase in car costs. So um, that leaves us with a shortfall of just under $300,000. So uh, that's about 0.28 mills. So one way to address this um, is to increase the mill rate on the uh, real property by 0.28 mils, which would then cover that gap. But it's, it's a discussion, I suppose, for the Board of Finance when they uh, set the mill rate for the budget. Uh, regarding that, I did reach out to our legislators and they were allegedly looking into it. I haven't heard anything yet. They were quite surprised that this happened. Um, so, <laughs> well, why should they be surprised? <laughs> so, they, you know, I, Tony and I sent a memo to uh, State Senator Cabrera about that. I also reached out to a friend who used to work for OPM. Well, she didn't, she has a different job up at the state, but she was also going to look into that if you, I don't know. And um, we also, CCM is aware of it because it's not only Woodbridge, there's several other towns. Several towns. Glastonbury, I believe, and there was a couple more that are bigger that have substantial um, holes. So I'm not sure how this is all going to resolve. But um, you know, once again, don't tell me you're going to make us whole and then not make us whole. So it was very disturbing. So, the, the real, the real concern also here is not just the fact that we're short uh, this year, but 
the erosion of that $1 million over time. If, if it's like any other grant program that we've received, a lot of them decline over time. We used to get close to a million dollars for ECS, a little less. Now we get 400 and something. So uh, we have a history, the state has a history of, of, um, of reducing our grant, our grant amounts, formulary grant amounts. So that's, I, that, in my opinion, that's a big issue is that eventually that $1 million will disappear. So it's it's uh, I'll I'll try to be on on top of it in the budget you know process with the state next year, but I don't know. There's only so much we can do. So just to that's that. Okay. Um, do you want to keep going, Tony, on adopted budget? Up to you. Are you? Is, is there is there any public comments? We could take a break. It's it, well, it's five. It's five months. Okay. Yep. I'll keep going. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> so, um, I have a chart that was handed out, which is a history of our adopted budgets uh, going back to 2015. And um, this came up in the uh, discussions for the uh, strategic plan. And uh, we all thought it would be helpful, that the two members thought it would be helpful for this to be presented to the full board. So um, I wanted to present that to you. That what this shows you are the adopted budgets. I, I selected adopted budget because uh, that's what you create when you're that's what you have when you're creating your your financial plan for the town that's sort of your um your what your ideals and your goals are uh for the town so it really shows where your priorities are so uh, if you look at the um uh top section there's a uh, history by major category and so it has the town departments uh amity board of education and woodbridge board of education and uh, so from 15 to 23, which is the uh, current um, budget that we have, uh, a preliminary budget, 5.19%. So that's um, over several years. That, that portion of the that portion of the budget's gone up about 5.19%. Uh, the Amity Board of Education at the same time period has gone up about 30%. And the Woodridge Board of Education has gone up about 26%. So you can see by that chart, by those three categories, clearly where the um, increases have been over that time period. I did break it down further, just sort of break down the 5% a little more for you. So you can see, you know, what, what does that 5% mean in terms of the town? Because, you know, there's different sections of the town. And um, so you can see that the, um, in the town side, um, public, you know the the total budget for the time period for all for the all three is up eighteen percent. So you can see that the public safety is just about eighteen percent, just about the average. Um, general government, public works, community services, and um, capital are all below average. In particular, community services in the capital, you'll see the biggest drop, uh, as well as debt service. So it just gives you an idea of where. Um, where your dollars are going over that time period. Um, uh, one one issue, um, just to sort of keep an eye on, is capital and debt service. Um, so debt service reflects your investment in your infrastructure, and capital represents your investment in your you know ongoing capital costs. So that's just a, just keep in mind we don't want to get too far behind on some, especially the capital line. We you know, um, so th that's the uh, that's the chart. Uh, one footnote there. Uh, the um, under community services, which is basically human services, recreation, and library. Um, there's a footnote there because the first year contains country club costs, which we no longer have, and it's not a function we currently have. So if you take that out, their increase is about 5.3% over that time period. So hopefully this is helpful to you. I can certainly get more information. I could break this down even further, but I just thought it would be helpful for you to see this over time. Thanks, Tony. Anyone have any questions? I had a, a yep. quick question. And once again, Tony, this is this has been very helpful for the strategic planning committee. So this is really important uh, information. So we have a history. But I wonder if there's a way that we can illuminate a little bit more about the Amity Board of Education number, um, because there's been discussion about Although their budget has gone up, they've been returning surplus on a regular basis. There's a lot of interest in how that surplus functions, but we don't show it here at all. So what we're showing we show it here because this is yeah. this is their budget. This is the budget they create. Yes. Right. This is, this is what we're raising taxes on. 
right? Exactly. Now, there is, a, there is an offset to taxes and the revenues uh, because they do return surplus. I didn't put that in here because it'll just complicate things significantly. But that is a factor here. Yes. Yeah, and, I, and, and unfortunately, that is a factor that complicates people's understanding of the Amity budget. And, and as we have seen, it's causing some trouble. But right. in the way that it flows back to us, I, I, don't, I guess it goes into the general fund or it helps to fund other... Well, it's the tax rate because we use, a, yeah. we use a portion of most of it in some years or all of it in some years uh, to um, offset the tax rate. Right. So, and unfortunately, we, we can't predict it because we have no idea. Right. That it comes. Yeah. Correct. Right. You can't predict it because it's a it's a volatile source of revenue because you can't predict it from one year to the next. Yeah. So maybe there's a way to capture both the the unpredictable nature of revenue, right? So as we just discussed, that motor vehicle um, fund right. that we're getting now, and the Amity, but like maybe there's just one other line. So because we haven't raised. Um, I could do taxes in this amount that we're showing. We have right? not. That's correct. That's yeah. a very good observation. Yes. Let's hope we haven't raised taxes in this amount. <laughs> yeah, no, we haven't. No. Yeah. But this is really helpful. I think this is a great start for explaining it to the public. Okay. Thank I could you. put something together on that and we can review it further. Great. Thanks so much. I, okay. I have a question uh, related to public safety. Could you go, go into that a little bit further in terms of uh, breaking it down? What What is included in that? Because I know it's police, fire. What, what I mean, that's, a good, that's a good example uh, to, to sort of include. Uh, so public safety includes police, fire, EMS, animal control, and building official. So those are sort of all of our safety-related functions. Uh, so if, to break that down further, the police department's up 14.36%. The fire department's up 51.69%. EMS is up 8.59%. Animal control is down 6.35%, and the building officials down about 22%. So within public safety, you can see that, um, you know, fire and then police um, have been increased, while EMS is uh, pretty flat and uh, animal control and building official have decreased. So part, part, of the fire, part of the fire increase is the cost from the radio. Which we had to put in, which we put oh. in a few years ago, if you remember. So th that that's one reason why their budget has gone up um, since that you know that time period. So that was like one hundred fifty thousand dollars on a six you know six seven hundred thousand dollar budget. But. Okay. Well, thank you. Thanks, Tony. I was just going to ask. Yep. <laughs> Okay. okay, I think I think if it's okay with the board, I will because um, the transfer station is a little bit more complicated and pithy. So, if it's okay with everyone. We'll go back to now that it's six oh two. We will go back to public comment, and I will call uh, call on Jerry Shaw to say if there's any first written comments as of three p.m. today. There were no written comments as of three p.m. today, and there is nobody in the waiting room to make a public comment. Okay, thank you so much. Um, that was quick. I thought it was going to be okay. And with that, we'll go back to item uh, e, uh, seven. Yes. Uh, you know, I had a request from, uh, I know we all received a, a February letter from, from, uh, Bill Silverberg. And I, I had a request to have that read into the public record as I know it's, not normal, but our public comments haven't been normal in this time of COVID. But it was the record. He wished it to be read into the public record as as uh, public comment. And I wondered if that would be appropriate or allowed. Uh, you're muted. Well, uh, this is Jerry Weiner. All I can say it's is Jerry, to rule on that because I don't know. We haven't done that for anyone else, and it would be inappropriate just to pick one out and do it. If we were going to do it for everybody, that would be one thing, but I think it is inappropriate to pick one letter out and have that read. It's a public record. There is in the files, and anyone can see them if they want. Yeah, well, Jerry, the reason the reason was that other letters have been read in uh, at, at, on occasion, and I don't know what distinguishes those from other letters that we, we receive as, as board members. But it is true that other letters have been read into the public record in you this forum, in, in our in our board meetings. 
And it, typically they are read in by our first selectman, which is appropriate. We get so, those and then I put them in my list and I read them if they ask me to do it. So yeah, I didn't know yeah. about this. So perhaps, well, you, you know, I think, yeah. I think Bill just didn't feel comfortable getting online to do this. So otherwise he would have done it himself. But have said it to you why, if you don't want me to do it, it'll, it'll wait until the next meeting when someone else will do it. Have him either send it to me and I'll do it or uh, he can attend. Well, it was sent to all of us, but it just never made it into the public record. And okay. I think I think everybody got the letter. That's that's yeah. a, it's it's not that important to me he right now. Me, he did not ask me in the letter to read it into, so I didn't. Usually folks ask. So okay. Thanks. So I just muted and unmuted again. Okay, thank you. Now we're back to item uh, we're la, 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 nine uh, E transfer station update. Tony, you're on again, please. Okay. Uh, the last item I have is an update on the transfer station. Um, the first is in um, a summary of expenditures and revenues. This was asked, uh, requested by the Board of Finance at their last meeting. So I thought it'd be helpful for you to see as well. Uh, this, these are the costs we had to uh, install the scale. Uh, you can see here by the uh, chart that the uh, scale installation budget was 103,000 and the actual was 113,000. Uh, we had some um, site related expenditures that we hadn't realized we would have until we actually were on site. We were able to cover those with their operating budget and some um, surplus funds that we had. Uh, the um, while we were there, we did uh, pave the site, which uh, was somewhat related to the scale, but not completely. That was about $60,000. We uh, used our paving budget for that. And um, so you can see the um, the total we've um, brought in since the um, installation of the scale has been about $175,000. So uh, those are sort of some of the uh, figures for you to take a look at. Uh, what I also wanted to share with you was the uh, our tonnage history at the transfer station over the past uh, five years. Uh, the first is if you look at the uh, solid waste numbers, we typically did, uh, those are in tons, we typically uh, would typically do about 26 to 2,800 tons a year for many years. And in 20, we installed the scale 2020. That's the fiscal year. You can see a reduction in tonnage in 2020 and 21 uh, and a slight uptick in 22 to about, um, we're at about estimated about 2,000 tons. So um, the question is, is that related to the scale or not? Um, it's our suspicion that it is. Uh, there was also COVID there in that time period. So um, we'll say, well, what happened to other sources of, of, um, of waste? Uh, demo and bulky waste has increased significantly during COVID. Uh, we were at 300 tons in 18, 372 tons in 18, uh, 428 tons in 19, and 600 tons uh, approximately in 20 and 21. So we saw an increase in our bulky waste there. Uh, you'll notice the um, estimated reduction for 22. Um, a lot of that since February, since you instituted the fee, we've seen a decline in tonnage. We'll see if if that holds over the next few months. Um, and then finally, our single stream recycling is the last line. That's, of course, the one we want to increase. So we encourage people to recycle. And um, you see it's been pretty steady over the past three years at about 720 to 760 tons. Hopefully that's helpful for you. I just thought you'd find it interesting. Thank you. Any okay. questions for uh, Tony on any of this? Very, very thoughtful, good explanation of everything. I like graphs as well, because I like, I can see right, it. Right. It's easier for me than numbers. Right. So. For visual people, I always try to include a graph. That's me, yep. <laughs> and, you, and you know how much we love garbage too, Tony. What's that? You know how much we love garbage, so yeah. that's <laughs> right. <laughs> Yeah, garbage in, garbage out. Yep, exactly. Fancy name, MSW. I love it. It's municipal solid waste. Right, that's what that stands AKA for. garbage. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Tony. Do you have an other yeah. other? I do not. Okay, with that, we will move on to number 10. All right, and I just have, one, I have a question for Tony. Yep. Um, do you have any, yeah, on the human services grant from the... Uh, uh, a, the Agency for Aging, do you have any update on that grant? It was an ARPA funding grant, and they haven't gotten any word about that. I, I do not. I haven't heard anything either, but I can look into it for you. Okay, and thank I'll, you. Yeah. 
Good. Okay. With that, uh, we'll, attend, we'll go to number 10, strategic plan update and discussion. And our two uh, uh, strategic plan mavens here, um, David and Sheila, are going to give us an update and probably go through each item because I, I think I prefer to do it that way instead of just asking us to review. I, I need to do a bit more. So I'm hoping you guys are willing to go for it. And I think Betsy. Sure, for the, for, yeah, for the visual learners, we'll put it up on the screen. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Great. Okay, so I think everyone can see this. Um, we're, we've started off what's new since the last time you've looked at it is we have a bit of a preamble here that we're drafting. Um, this is just explaining why it is we believe we need to have this plan and just a document that, that tells us we're, what we're trying to do as a board with this plan. So then if we go to the beginning and we start with our first major goal, I'll just run through it really quickly. And then David, I want you to jump in with some discussion as well. Um, so ensuring financial stability. Uh, Sheila, I'm going to interrupt one second. Could I ask everyone who's not speaking to please mute themselves as it's a little disruptive. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, so we have three major uh, goal areas. And the first is to ensure financial stability. We put this first for a reason. We believe it's one of the, the prime things that we're doing as the Board of Selectmen. And then we've um, grouped underneath that some initiatives. So diversifying and growing the grand list in a responsible, sustainable fashion. Um, we've identified both a goal for that and then some tactics. And importantly, the, I think this might be new since the last we looked at this as well, we have partners identified. Um, it's not that we're delegating this uh, work to others. We are working in partnership with some various either task forces, commissions, boards, or um, uh, ad hocs, as, as the case may be as we go through it. So um, I think that's an area where we may identify some more partnering organizations, but this is our draft at this point. So the next kind of sub goal for this financial. Sheila, I, would just, I would just add to the partners piece. Yeah. As we move forward, should we put any of our initiatives on a on an agenda for the board to look at and see how we're doing? We could ask those partners to make reports to that particular month's agenda so that we could see where we stand with each of our strategic objectives. Thank you. Yeah, that's a good that's a good um, uh, encapsulation of what we were discussing in terms of adding these items to agendas. So being a partner is more than just being on this piece of paper. It is also coming and participating with us, providing us with information, answering questions, helping us to think through these larger issues. Um, okay, so support and enhance the business community. That's kind of a component of this larger goal. You can see that we've um, got a couple of different partners identified already. I think that may, uh, again, increase. And then um, the continued financial transparency, I think I think everyone believes we're doing a really good job of this. And I think we're continuing that. The uh, information and data that Tony just shared with us is another example of that. Um, and then exploring shared services, regionalization, um, while maintaining our core services. This is kind of an important piece that the board, um, we touch on it. Uh, and, and we'd like to just kind of focus some attention. We've identified some partners for this as well. Um, let's continue on to the second major goal uh, area is to maintain and invest in the infrastructure and facilities. So, you know, we, we take very seriously our commitment to making sure that, you know, the things that are owned by townspeople as, as residents are maintained and, and taken care of in the appropriate manner. So our first initiative here you'll see is determine the CCW future use. That's a big one. Um, we're gonna have a lot more discussion on that one. We just wanna make sure that we include it in the proper place in this document for now. Um, then you'll see moving forward with building projects. That is something that we're getting updates on on a regular basis, but we've tried to kind of put them into categories of, of what's important, what we're trying to achieve with the various projects that are going on, but we're gonna have a lot to track on that. Um, and you'll see the partners there as well. Uh, importantly, we have the Woodbridge Board of Ed identified as a partner to help us with the Beecher Road School. That is a very important, very large investment where a lot of um, children are, are there, a lot of staff are there. We wanna make sure that that's uh, in the radar of the Board of Selectmen as well as the Board of Ed, which we know is keeping a close eye. Okay, let's go down a little bit further. 
um, the town center beautification plan. Um, we talked about making sure that people understand when we're talking about the town center, that's very separate from the business district or the business center of town. And we think that with some um, nomenclature, like naming, signage, that sort of thing, we'll have people understanding that uh, the town center has a certain look and feel and a place and a, a, a use by citizens. We want to encourage the use there. Um, and that's separate from what we're going to do in the business district. Uh, then we have the focus on environment and energy efficiency. That's kind of shot through with everything we do, but we felt it belonged in the kind of facility uh, headline at first, uh, at least so that we can identify our partners and, and you know work forward on that. You'll see that the transfer station is there when we talk about uh, things like glass recycling, et cetera. Let's go down a little further. And this, this is our third and final major goal category, enhancing the quality of life. So, you know, we try to identify the um, initiatives and things that the Board of Selectmen can do. We have a lot of boards and commissions that work on this, and this is their work and their focus. We want to just make sure that we're being good partners with them. Uh, so we've got them all listed here. We want to explore some ways that we can be efficient. We've, we've talked about this before in the budget process, but we'll do further exploration with our partners. And if we scroll down a little bit more, I think we're almost at the end. Things like biking and walking and making the town um, more useful to people, improving parks and playgrounds, all of these things, including the town-owned parks and property. And then, then we talk pretty importantly here about wanting to reflect the people who live here and make sure that people feel like they can participate and that you know they have a sense of belonging in our community. So that's where you'll see the ad hoc community council, the recreation, library, human services, and the ad hoc diversity, equity, inclusion committee. Um, and then the townwide beautification, because it goes beyond just the campus town campus center. Uh, we've got the beautification project. And as we talked at ordinance committee, this is this is something we'd want everyone to take pride in. So we have that included here. <clears throat> So David, do you want to jump in with any observations about how this process has gone? <laughs> well, it, you know, I think it's 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 been a pretty good process. We sort of intentionally avoided uh, putting too much specificity in because we think that specific things need to be really discussed and thought about and, and worked through and perhaps even fought over because there are all kinds of implications whenever you get down to the specifics, some of them being budget related. And, and you know, I think we will get a lot of pushback from different citizens who are feeling the pinch. So when we say we're gonna expand something, people are gonna say, well, it means you're gonna spend more money, you know, more bigger government, we don't want that. So, I mean, there are gonna be all kinds of reactions. So I don't think we should assume that the language commits us to any one course of action on these things because we've tried to sort of make the the uh, language a little bit neutral to allow us to just outline the things that we think are the big strategies and then uh, some tactics to get to those strategies, which also would then be things that we could we could really look at during our meetings. Maybe, you know, Maybe every month we look at where we are with one of these things, and that way we would keep progress moving forward instead of laying, letting things that are most difficult lie dormant for long periods of time. Uh, and I think that would be helpful for both us and for other committees who find themselves in the same, other boards, other commissions who find themselves in the same fix with their, with their uh, process. Yeah, that, that is something similar to what um, the boards of education are always told when they're doing strategic planning is to make sure that you're approaching it as a balance, right? So we, we need to balance the need to and desire to do all kinds of new things with how are we going to pay for it. But then also to embed it into our monthly meeting so that we make sure we stay on track and we don't end up with like three or four big issues all coming to the same meeting, which makes the meeting you know less efficient if we're going to you know, spend hours and hours on it. So we're, we're going to, I think what will happen next for this um, committee is two things. One, we've um, sort of have a commitment to share some sort of draft at the annual town meeting. 
Um, so importantly, we wanna hear your input tonight and we'll pause for a minute and let ever, other people ask questions or give some comment. But I think we'd like to get a condensed version of this. I would love to fit it on one piece of paper front and back so that we can share it as a draft. It's not finished and it's not final yet, but we would want the community to see it and perhaps we can have a document ready to hand out at the meeting or put online, et cetera, put up on the screen. Um, and then secondly, I would say uh, trying to figure out the timeline of when certain things can be on the uh, agenda of our board meetings. So that's something that Beth, we would be coming back to you. Maybe we'll invite you to the next strategic planning committee meeting and we can start to map out what does the year look like. This plan is meant to sort of begin in July for that fiscal year. So, um, but do other people have uh, questions, comments, concerns, anything to chime in? Sure. I do. <laughs> Thank you. You guys have done an amazing job. Let me say that first. I'm, I'm so pleased with all of this. It's it's wonderful. It's very thought, well thought well, out. And well, thanks to the staff that are supporting absolutely. us. That's Patsy and Tony. We want to Patsy make and sure Tony that are amazing. Yes. I'm, here, I'm, here, I'm here from them that they think you guys are amazing. So I guess no, they, it's working. they've done the heavy lifting here. There's no yeah. question. It's working well. Um, I, I have to just, I don't know how to uh, phrase this in terms of Perhaps just a request, I'll throw it out there because you, you guys are putting this together. But um, let's just say, for example, that I ran into someone at the Woodbridge Fathers Baseball League who reminded me that we still would like to have a 90 foot diamond and suggested that we put it in as perhaps ARPA money. So I thought, well, I will bring it to this group. I don't know if it can be added under improved parks and playgrounds. Um, the issue was maybe the cost might be as much as. We, we don't know, but I, I reached out to this individual later and he said, let's talk. But there was a possibility of a number where they came up with half of it. And, you know, we spent, put it out over a couple of years in our uh, capital budget. So just, I'd like you to just think about that in terms of our funding, because it is something that um, has been around for, speaking about it, it's something that for a long time, and maybe we can get it off the ground finally, because it's, uh, it's, it's a good thing. And there were so many kids there that day yeah. and if they would stay and play if they could you a lot of folks drop out um sure. at, before Babe Ruth because I know my son my third son was a baseball player and he uh he left because uh, well he didn't leave actually but but the, the hardest thing for him was we had to find practice spaces we either went to Bethany or Orange Munson Field yep. or the other one and the yep. like, and you know we could have a, a since we're trying to keep everybody safe and outside in case this, this COVID thing continues for a length of time, it'd be nice to have that come back and we can bring kids to Woodbridge, bring families to Woodbridge. Oh, and, and it just, you know, from out of town, if there are, uh, anyway. So I just thought I'd bring that up. And last- Those are, let me just respond to that really quickly because we did talk about the POCD obviously has that 90 foot diamond in it. It's one of the initiatives that's meant to be explored. So we were also thinking the POCD has some things that we should, you know, make sure We've in, at least referenced, maybe we could create links in this document to the POCD. Um, and then also the ARPA funding uh, discussion. Uh, we want this plan to help structure that conversation. So if things are gonna end up in ARPA, they should also be in this plan as well. So this is where we're gonna be a little dynamic, I think. Thank you, I appreciate it. I, I told him I would bring it up. And, and I'm glad you both spoke about coming Monday evening because we were going over how it's gonna work in terms of who's speaking first at the annual town meeting and the moderator will open the meeting and then I'm planning to give sort of a, a, a shorter version of my uh, state of the town remarks that I gave in the freezing cold um, at the preliminary budget hearing. And I just give a quick synopsis and you know, it was so cold. I, haven't, I think I haven't warmed up yet, I'm trying. And uh, and then then perhaps um, if you would be willing, we you could meet you know get together with Betsy and just for, come up with that slide. We'll put it up, and the two of you just step up to the podium and give sort of a quick something you know four or five minutes about this plan because I I did say that we would be talking about it um, or bringing it up for the first time at the annual town meeting, so that would help a lot. And then I guess Tony after that will do his budget uh, remarks to the folks before before we continue with the meeting. So if you'd be willing to do that, I'd appreciate that very much. Sure, yeah, I think I think if we have a handout for people that will be really useful, but then also up on the screen. And, and uh, if you'd like us to have a speaking role in this, I think David and I could probably 
speak for a minute or two um, and then ask people if they, they want to respond or, or provide comments either at that meeting or at a future Board of Selectmen meeting. Good. I appreciate that. Thank you. And um, just before I forget, this reminds me, when COVID gets better, at some point, we still have not forgotten it related to Beecher Road School, we have to do a tour um, of the school. So just let's keep that on our agenda at some point when things get a little better. We can certainly do the outside, but I think the facility inside Maybe sometime during next year, when, as we plan out our budget, we should take a look. So with that, I will be quiet now because I don't want to take more time. If anyone else, go for it. I just think it would be good for us to have the opportunity for citizens to digest our strategic draft and offer their own opinions, even though this is the board's strategic plan. I can't help but think that it would be improved if people see problems with it or have questions or worry about it, <clears throat> you know, we ought to start off on the right foot by letting everybody know they have access. That's a good idea. Maybe it's also something we should plan to share with the other boards and commissions. Um, you know, make sure we have our partner list in, as inclusive as possible, but then also as liaisons, as the Board of Selectmen liaisons, we, you, you might want to ask to be on their agenda just to let them know uh, how this all might uh, impact them or suggestions they might have. Sure, I, I would leave that to some of you to begin to send this out. Sounds good. I will be one. Anybody else from the board have any comments or questions? Great job yeah. again. Yeah, I, I'm glad to see that the country club is listed as a um, you know something worthy of preservation and maintenance of town facilities, but I think maybe we should expand the thinking on that to quality of life because there's tremendous potential for recreation at that facility. Um, and we've, we've kind of not really thought about that. Uh, and in terms of, you know, giving back to the town, using that property for recreation, uh, if we have a funding source for that, uh, would be um, a, a huge asset to the town. Um, you know, I'm thinking of the infrastructure that we have in place that we've kind of mothballed uh, that might be resurrected. Um, you know, there was um, there was a, a couple, there were a few letters about uh, solar farms, which I'm not, you know, I haven't exactly made up my mind uh, on, but it's, you know, not appropriate to discuss here anyway. But if we were to get a revenue source from something like that or from ARPA funding, maybe we should think about um, developing that property for recreation use for the town. We don't have a pool. Um, we have tennis courts there. Um, we had a plan for nine hole golf course. We could uh, certainly have an ice skating rink and miniature golf up there. We could make it a, a wonderful recreation center that the town would use and would be proud of and would be a, a selling point for people who wanted to move in here. So I just wanted to, to mention that and you know have people sort of think about that. Uh, and expand our view about what the possibilities are with that property. Thank you. Anybody else? Thanks, Dave. And, and that does point out that we we one of the things we struggle with in these is you can't put things in categories. Because the minute you put them in the categories, we, we see, well, maybe it should be in the di completely different category or every category. And, it, you know, we realize there'll be a lot of bleed over in other categories as we as we approach these things, but getting them in the plan is the first step. I agree with you, David. It reminds me as a visual learner of concentric circles. You know, they're gonna, things are gonna overlap. So mm -hmm. I'll, I'll expect that now. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, anyone else? Okay, thank you, Betsy, for sharing the screen. And we'll go back to, uh, oh, good segue here. Um, let's see, what are we up to? With that, um, Assistant Administrative Officer's Report, Betsy. Good evening, everybody. Um, I had hoped that um, one of our EDC members, um, Sean Flynn, would be able to join us this evening to walk you all through the um, recommendation from the EDC for the town to sign on to an agreement with YIFTI. However, he has another um, commitment and is not available until closer to seven o'clock. So I'll just um, quickly walk you through the EDC's thinking. Um, they had a few years ago done something called Woodbridge Bucks, 
And that was a gift card program that the EDC did to encourage people to spend locally. So they um, gave out $20 gift cards to residents, to participating businesses, and then the EDC reimbursed the businesses that received those gift cards. So this YIFTI program that they're proposing is a more formalized version of that. It's, um, I believe it's Visa, it's um, an e-gift card, and there's no cost to the town to participate. There's no cost to businesses to participate. Uh, there is a uh, transaction fee for the person who purchases the gift card. So this is a program that's run in other towns. They use IFTI or other, sorry, YIFTI or other similar uh, programs. Middletown does something like this. Mystic does something like this. And it's a way to encourage people to keep their spending locally. So the EDC is requesting that the um, town enter into an agreement with YIFTI and attorney Weiner has reviewed the uh, agreement and has given me his his thumbs up on it. Um, and if this is approved, the EDC would spend some of their budget to kick off the program and hand out gift cards, uh, possibly at events and other things like that. Thank you. Anyone have any questions on this? You have it in your packet at the, from the town of Pleasantville. I love it. <laughs> Uh, any comments or questions? I, I just had a quick question. It, it looks like a really interesting presentation deck. Um, does the EDC have specific goals in mind that they think they'll achieve with this, or are they sort of starting out the program and they'll see what comes of it? I think they're, they're just, they didn't have any um, specific goals. Um, interestingly, I just got an invitation today from Connecticut Main Street. Um, they're hosting a workshop next week about um, Middletown's success with this program, and it has um, do's and don'ts and other tips. So mm -hmm. I will be attending, and I'm hoping some of the EDC members can attend as well so that we can figure out how to be most effective with this when we're trying to steer people to shop locally. Great, thanks. Great. Well, we'll get we'll move forward, and then if there's further discussion after we have a motion, um, I will make a motion that we agree to or approve um, entering into uh, for the Economic Development Commission's recommendation to uh, to enter into the agreement with EFD, as described by Betsy um, in her remarks. Is there a second? Second. Thanks, Joe. Any other questions or discussions or comments from Betsy? Uh, no. For Betsy. Um, is there a dollar amount or there, you said there was no cost, but is there a dollar amount in the contract? No, there's no cost to the town. The cost is borne by um, anyone who decides to purchase a gift card. So EDC will be buying some gift cards. So for that reason, there will be a cost to the town through the EDC's purchase of the gift cards, but there's not a cost to the town to participate in this agreement. Okay. And doing it now, they're able to use current year funding for that? Correct. Great. Thank you. Anything else? Okay, we have a motion and a second. Um, let's see, David Vogel. Aye. Uh, Sheila McCrabbin. Aye. David Lober. Aye. Paul Kyriakos. Aye. Beth Heller, aye, and Joe Crisco. Aye. Thank you, and thank the EDC for Commission for uh, working so hard on this. Good, good job. Thank you. Certainly. So they meet tomorrow night, so I will share the good news with them tomorrow. And they are also organizing a Make Music Day, which is um, on the summer solstice, June 21. And if we're able to get everything set up um, in time, there may be some uh, Yifty gift cards to give out at the uh, Make Music Day events. They're um, organizing simultaneous concerts in the business district on the evening of June 21 from about 5 to 7 p.m. We've got three locations that are signed on and I'm in communication with another two. So the goal for EDC is to capture the uh, commuter traffic and uh, encourage people to stick around and see what we have to offer in the business district. It's wonderful, very exciting things. Thank you. Um, next item is recreation online registration vendor permission to sign contract with 
civic plus or civic rec. Okay. So a little background on this, the town uh, website is uh, run by an organization called Civic Plus and Civic Plus um, has several features that are add-ons, including one called Civic Rec. And Civic Rec is a way for residents to um, sign up online and pay for programs through the recreation department. They currently have a program that they're using, um, but the vendor, uh, when the new contract starts on July 1, will be significantly increasing the costs to the town. Um, and I was approached by Civic Plus, our current website vendor, about um, exploring a relationship with Civic Rec. And after we looked into it, we realized that there is more functionality and the costs will be lower to the town. So the recreation department is thrilled about this opportunity. And of course, Tony is thrilled that we'll be saving money. Any uh, questions on this for, um, for Betsy? I, I think we might be thrilled as well. Um, I, I had a quick question. Um, is it the human services department that also does a registration payment sort of thing? And do they use a different vendor? How does it, how does it work? I'm not sure about that, Tony. I know that they've explored the relationship, but I'm not sure what came of it. So the uh, human services department uses it, uh, the program for a few limited uh, items. If, like same if they, one that REC uses, right? So will yeah. they use this one too? The same one, yeah, yeah. Ah, great. We're consolidating services under one contract. Nice. Okay, thank you. Um, is there a motion to um, approve the recreation department we notebook to hold the terms? Recreation online registration vendor permission to sign the contract with Civic Plus or Civic Rec. Is there a motion? So moved. Thanks, Paul. Is there a second? A second. Thanks. Well, oh, come on, guys. <laughs> okay, with that, um, I will. Any other discussion? Hearing none, I will call the question. Joe Crisco? Aye. Beth Heller? Aye. Paul Kirikos? Aye. David Lober? Aye. Sheila McCrevin? Aye. And David Vogel? Aye. Thank you all very much with that. Okay, and anything else, Betsy? Yeah, I just want to um, give a quick update about two um, different things going on with the ad hoc committees that I work with. First, um, on Saturday, as was mentioned earlier, the um, Community Council is hosting the first ever bike fun ride. That's going to be on the library lawn and the um, Amity Bike Shop will be on hand to conduct safety checks of bikes to make sure everybody's operating safely before the ride begins. Um, the Beecher Green team will be on hand to help um, anybody who's interested in decorating their bike before the bike ride. And when the ride uh, ends, there will be lawn games and live music on the library lawn. So it should be a fun event. Fingers mm -hmm. crossed that the weather holds for us. Um, the other ad hoc committee that I work with, the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee, has just created an Experiencing Woodbridge survey. And the goal of the survey is to better understand the concerns and experiences of residents so that the committee can focus their efforts on making sure that Woodbridge is a welcoming and inclusive place for all residents. The link to that survey will go out in the e-newsletter this Friday, and it will be on the town website shortly. Thank you much. And um, with that, we will go to uh, two other items, which I know you have they're not under you, but they are under you. An application to hold events on the town property. One of them, the first one is the Woodbridge Child Care Center graduation. I believe they have to ask our permission to do so. It's going to be, we have it in your packet. Um, it's on June 9. Right. I, I think all of you should just come to that. It's so adorable, it, it, weather permitting. There's four year olds in regalia and in a little line, they can't even walk straight in line. It is so cute. So I just come for fun. It's so delicious. So um, I'll make a motion that we approve that application. Is there a second? Second. Thanks, Joe. Any comments or questions on this? Hearing none. David Vogel. Aye. Thank you. Sheila McCrevin. Aye. 
Thanks. David Lober. Aye. Paul Kyriakos. Aye. Beth Heller. Aye. Sorry. <laughs> I can't answer my own question. <laughs> and Joe Crisco. Aye. Thank you. I'm <laughs> sitting there in outer space. Okie doke. And lastly, the banner for summer concerts with the recreation department. They want to put up a banner on the fence um, related to the concerts. We have a request from John Adamovich. I will make a motion that we allow them to put the banner up on the center road field fence from June 1st, 2022 through July 30th, 2022. And then along the gazebo from July 1 through July 31st, 2022. Um, I'm, I'm sure they'll be responsive and responsible in terms of sight, sight lines and stuff. You know, and especially around the um, the gazebo area, so it's been where it goes. So with that, um, I made that motion. Is there a second? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other comments, questions, discussion? Hearing none. Joe Crisco. Aye. Beth Heller. Aye. Paul Kyriakos. Aye. Uh, David Lober. Aye. Sheila McCreven. Aye. And David Vogel. Yes. Okay. Thanks so much. Okie doke. Item 14 on the agenda is acknowledge, acknowledge receipt of the town clerk's reports. They are in your packet. I will move that we approve them or acknowledge receipt rather of the town clerk's reports. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Any discussion on this? David Vogel. Aye. Sheila McCreven. Aye. David Lober. Aye. Paul Kyriakos. Aye. Beth Heller. Aye. And Joe Crisco. Aye. Thank you. Next item on the agenda is, uh, let's see if I'm correct, the minutes. We have, you have in your packet, the Board of Selectmen regular meeting minutes of April 13th, 2022. I will motion that we approve them. Is there a second? I second. Okay, thank you. Um, is there any additions, edits, corrections, changes, comments? Hearing none. Joe Crisco. Aye. Beth Heller, aye. Paul Kyriakos. Aye. David Lober. Aye. Sheila McRevin. Aye. And David Vogel. Yes. Thank you so much. Uh, next item on the agenda, we have, uh, as, as uh, David mentioned, we have a resignation from James Moriarty, who uh, is resigning from the Library Commission. Unfortunately, he, he couldn't stay. He's moving out of town. And um, to, to that position is open. Uh, is, is right now for June 30th to 2023. And also we received a resignation from David Ross from the Woodbridge Board of Education through June 30th, 23. And he also moved out of town. So with that, we will acknowledge <laughs> the resignations and accept them with regret. Thank you. Let's go on, sorry guys. Next on the agenda is an appointment, um, town plan and zoning alternate through June 30th, 2023. Sheila, do you have a nomination? Yes, I'd like to uh, nominate Robert Reed. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Um, and this CV is in the packet. And are there any other nominations? Uh, yeah, I have a nomination. Ed, sure. Uh, if, if I may be indulged, uh, briefly, I'd like to preface my nomination with a couple of observations that you know, I really enjoy uh, watching and attending these boards and commissions. And really, honestly, I'm impressed the talent and hard work of our volunteers, our citizens who simply serve for the good of this town. I, I think we can all follow their example. Uh, but you all know that I really think that uh, this was my first experience on the board. I feel that it's an example of extreme political partisanship and I don't think it's good for Woodbridge. I hope we can change it in the future. So I'd just like to say that openly to you. It has affected my view of the collegiality of our Board of Selectmen, and, and I don't think it needs to be that way. Uh, it's ironic that we have a committee for diversity, equity, and inclusion in our for our town, and yet we seem to routinely reject the possibility of including the opinions of the 48% of the voters who voted for our minority candidates mm. and, and, our, and for our platform of ideas in the last election. So wh why is the diversity of political opinion and thought not diversity we should also embrace? It, it does seem to me that 
that our process does not really do this great justice. And and the even greater irony to me is that our your uh, Democrats to you, I guess I'm speaking mostly my colleagues, uh, your first selectman, Beth, agrees with me on this. I mean, she's on several occasions during her campaign in print at the town meetings has said that she thinks that our the best structure for our town is not partisan politics. And, and she's promised the citizens of Woodbridge that she would reach across the aisle to govern. So, you know, one way we can change it is by the way we vote. So I'm going to present to you another opportunity to keep the promise by nominating Nick Zito for TPZ alternate. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Okay, so we have two candidates. Uh, first one we will take up is Robert Reed. All in favor? Aye. Wait, Joe Crisco? Aye. Beth Heller, aye. Paul Kyriakos? Aye. David Lover? Well, since my vote doesn't count for anything in this kabuki dance, I will abstain from voting. I will hold my vote. Sheila McCrevin? Aye. And David Vogel? Nay. Thank you. Okay. And the motion carries 4 to 2. No, no, 4 3, three to, to 2 to 1 abstention. Okay. Jerry will get that right. Thank you so much. Uh, next on the agenda, we have Town Council's report. Um, Jerry Weiner, you're up. The first item is an explanation of affordable housing. Uh, state statute 830-8-30J. So uh, I, we've gone over this many, many times, but I, I was asked to give a presentation to the Board of Finance about the significance of 8-30G. It's a topic of conversation in our town and among our boards and commissions. I did it, and um, I'm just going to give you a very abbreviated um, version of what the 8-30G means to uh, the town and housing. Uh, again, um, the statute that we're talking about sets a benchmark, a, 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 a number of 10%, which is a number that the state has established for towns to achieve to avoid certain consequences of applications for housing in various towns for affordable housing to be approved or disapproved. In the traditional kind of a zoning application, a developer will come before the town and propose to build a house, to build five houses, to subdivide some property, which is, and it was, assuming it's not affordable, it's a regular run of the mill, run of the mill vanilla type of application. If that application is denied by the Planning and Zoning Commission, and the developer said, decides that that decision was mistaken and the developer wants to pursue it, he or she or it has the right to proceed before the Superior Court on an appeal. In that appeal, in a traditional zoning case, the burden is on the developer. The, de the town can sit back in its chair in court in front of a judge. The town's lawyer can sit back on a chair in front of the judge, do nothing, fold their arms and absolutely do nothing. The developer, on the other hand, must get up and convince the judge of the town's errors in denying that application. Generally, it is understood that a judge in those cases will almost, I can't say universally because there's obviously always exceptions, but in a large majority of those kind of cases, the judge will accede and, and, and honor the decision of the local planning and zoning commission. And it takes a decision uh, by the Planning and Zoning Commission that was arbitrary, capricious, or had no foundation in law for a judge to say, Planning and Zoning Commission, you were wrong. We're going to allow this project that this developer wanted to propose. So generally, in those traditional cases, a developer has a very hard burden to prevail when a zoning commission makes a determination that the application was inappropriate for the town, for the particular town, and did not comply with the town's regulations. In when we move to the affordable housing application, that burden uh, that that in the traditional case is on the developer switches to the town. Therefore, if the town denies an application for affordable housing, and the developer feels that it was erroneous. The developer then can apply to the Superior Court on an appeal. And the town now has that burden. 
to prove what it did was appropriate. And um, the commission, the Planning and Zoning Commission of the town, uh, must show that the decision is necessary to protect substantial public interests in health, safety, or other matters which the commission may legally consider. And such public interests clearly outweigh the need for affordable housing. And such public interests cannot be protected by reason by reasonable changes to the affordable housing uh, development. So that burden shifts, and you can see that language, and it's a very difficult language for the town now to go before a judge and say, hey, we did all these things properly. This application should be denied. The judge will make a determination whether the town had less than that 10% threshold. If you have more than the 10% threshold, then it's like a traditional case. The burden does not shift. If it's less than that 10% threshold that the state has established, the burden shifts to the town. And what it does, it, it, it could cause, and I'm not going to say likely, but, in, but it's much easier for the town to be at the will of a particular judge on a particular case to approve what kind of housing the town of Woodbridge will have. So naturally, there's a move, uh, and most towns that are prudent and want to avoid uh, the um, the uh, vulnerability of being at the whim of developers and the courts are trying to strive to attain the 10% benchmark uh, threshold, whatever you want to call it. I just want to make it clear also that and this was a question that was asked at the budget hearing. There is no penalty if a town does not have 10%. And by that, I mean you the state cannot fine you. They cannot hurt you. They cannot take your money away. The only... Uh, remedy in the statute for failure to have that 10% benchmark is the shifting of the burden on planning and zoning affordable housing applications, which should not be taken lightly. That is a real significant uh, uh, sword hanging over every single town in the state of Connecticut that doesn't have the 10%, which is which if you look at many of these towns, they're all trying to implement, implement certain kind of housing that will at least show a good faith effort to try and reach the 10% uh, uh, level. There's also something that when I said this, I told this to the Board of Finance, there's something in the statute, and I think it's in section J, which, uh, and 10% admittedly is gonna be very difficult for Woodbridge to achieve because we have 3,000 some odd houses that uh, uh, residences in Woodbridge, that means we have to have 300, approximately 300 is rounded numbers to achieve achieve that 10% uh, number and avoid being uh, subject to the onerous burden under 10 dash, um, under 8-30G. There is a provision for moratoriums. Certain towns, while not having the 10%, have the opportunity to apply to the De Department of Housing, the state of Connecticut Department of Housing, and show some, some, some improvement in their ability to uh, make available affordable, affordable housing in their particular town. It's based on a formula, and it's a 2% number rather than a 10% number. It's based on certain percentages that you get for certain kinds of housing. Um, and it, it's a very complicated uh, formula. But there is the opportunity, if you make certain strides, and even if you don't get to the 10%, if you can show you've gotten to a certain level and convinced the Department of Housing you've made some good faith efforts, you may be eligible for a moratorium, which gives the town approximately four years to evaluate, look at the issues, perhaps get some kind of housing that's acceptable to everybody that will get us closer to the 10%. So the argument that is we're never going to reach 10%, we should forget about it, is really not something that we should, we should, it's not the only avenue to protect the town. We can strive to do some good in attaining some kind of affordable housing so we may qualify for some kind of a moratorium. So that is my my my, my interpretation of 8-30G. Again, there is no penalty. There is no, no punishment if you don't meet it. The only thing that the statute now requires is for the town to come up with a ho affordable housing plan, which you know Beth has created a committee that has worked diligently for almost the last year, and you now have a draft of that plan, which you're going to discuss on um, May 25th and hopefully approve or make modifications to it. 
So that's my story on A-30G. I, any questions, I'll be happy to answer. Go ahead, David Vogel. Yeah, I have, I have a couple of questions, uh, Jerry. Uh, so as I understand it, what we have here that is naturally affordable does not qualify because it doesn't meet the deed restrictions and, and so on that are in the law. And and it's short of changing the law, that's or we so we either have to change the law or change the deed restrictions on these these properties that might otherwise be considered affordable. But uh, so I get that. I think that's that's part of the the difficulty of it is that we do have some homes that are under you know market value that is would qualify them, but they just aren't restricted. Uh, that but is it your understand i mean your belief i'm assuming that the case would be if some developer came in and had a piece of property that was not zoned for affordable housing because it was nowhere near sewers and water and they had a piece of property and wanted to put up dense dense housing on it could a judge say yeah woodbridge run water and sewers in there i mean Judges seem to have a lot of power in these things. Is that something that could actually happen? They have a tremendous amount of power, and that's what we're trying. That's what we should try to try to avoid being at the whim of a judge's power. And it's not power; it's it's the law. They follow the law, and the law says that they have the ability to impose these kind of um, of conditions. So the first thing is a very astute observation. Yes, everybody said we have a lot of houses in Woodbridge that are very that are not that expensive. You can buy a house for 300, 250, 350. Well, and that's affordable. You know, but that's not the standard as you just described. And, and I'm happy you mentioned that because I didn't say anything. It's got to be restricted to be a certain price for a certain number of years. And those number of years could be up to 40 years. So it's a long period of time. So those things that everybody thinks of immediately, what are they talking about? Woodbridge has a lot of affordable houses. Uh, that doesn't qualify uh, under that under the statute. So that's correct. Now, can a judge impose a will? It's will and require the town to construct or build um, sewers and and and, um, and water systems. Probably not. But that's one of the factors that a judge will take into consideration. That uh, generally, a planning and zoning commission turns down these applications because there is an insufficient water, there's insufficient there's insufficient public water and Public would serve these these properties and these projects. Keep in mind, there's all kinds of modern day uh, applications that can provide adequate septic and adequate water for a smaller development. Bigger developments, obviously, you'll have to go to the public sewer and the public water. But it, but but that's the standard that the town that the town generally says that no, we don't want this project because there's no sewer and there's no water. When a developer takes an appeal of that project, the developer will usually have an expert that will be that will demonstrate. And you know, you 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 pay for an expert, and an expert looks at it and make, makes a determination. You don't need public sewer and public and public water for this uh, thirty houses that you're going to produce because I develop I've designed a system that's going to be adequate. The judge the, and then town will probably have its own expert to say no, your expert is wrong. It's not going to be adequate. It's up to the judge then. To make that determination whether it's adequate or not and that's when the shifting of the burden becomes important because it's up to the town to show the developer's expert is 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 it is inferior and wrong and that's what makes it very difficult to, to sustain the denials of affordable housing projects yeah. hope i was clear and i hope you understand that i, I do okay good all right jerry so um i, I don't think you can out of hand hello yeah, I don't think you can out of hand dismiss this naturally affordable housing because this is convertible to legal affordable housing by deed restriction. And it's possible to do that um, by offering incentives to the, the owners. And that's one of the things that was mentioned in the, in the housing opportunity plan. So I, I think we still have to keep that on the table. That, that's a, possi a possibility. Um, the other thing that they talked about um, really had to do with developing um, housing from um, unoccup uno unoccupied buildings in the uh, in the business district in the in, in the industrial district 
to convert some of those buildings to uh, residential units. So there are, and there were some other things as well. Um, so I think we should, you know, kind of cast a broad net as far as the possibility goes as to where affordable housing can go. Uh, and I think this is actually another reason to maintain control of the country club property, because if we were to sell it to developers, since we don't have 10%, then it would fall under that category of we would have to defend it and it would be indefensible. Correct. Okay. Okay. I just want to get that out there. So, I mean, there are a lot, there are a lot of ways to, to, uh, you know, get affordable housing. And certainly if you can get, if you can get yeah, homeowners to sell their house with a deed restriction of 40 years on a certain amount of, of uh, a certain price, then yes, you do you do get a, a credit for uh, an affordable housing unit under the statute. Right. It's that easy to have somebody say, I'm going to keep my house at 200, that whatever the median income is for 40 years. But if you can, that, that, that complies with the statute. Well, I mean, I mean, you can incentivize them, you know, over the years with, you know, <laughs> with, with tax abatements. But one question I have, or maybe you, you can answer for me, is that affordability um, price a moving target or is it fixed? So right now, you know, we're talking about a median income of somewhere in the high, high 50,000s to, to be, um, you know, qualifying for affordable housing. But as inflation goes on, is that number going to change? And that will, will that affect the restriction? So will the $250,000 house, you know, ultimately go up to $350,000 in 20 years? That's a good question, and I don't yeah. know that answer. Yeah. I think yeah. there's nothing in the statute for uh, uh, cost of living increases on those numbers. I guess the legislature would have to look at it at some point and say cost of living has gone up so high, the numbers we have in there is unrealistic and no increase. You know, it's, you know, it's based on median income. It's based on a percentage of the median income in the area. So. Yeah, it's area median. The area median income is bound to vary. Of course. Right. Yeah. Jerry, can I ask you a quick question? Just a little follow up. Uh, Dr. Lober mentioned that in that housing uh, um, plan that's been presented to us, there are things like incentivizing, uh, you know, these these um, restrictions on deed, et cetera. If an incentive thing like that is something that that we choose to consider, is that at the ordinance level? Is that in the zoning regulation? What what's the mechanism for that sort of thing? I think the Board of Selectmen would then have the ability to, as David mentioned, you're going to have to set aside some money and incentivize homeowners to do it. You're going to have to make a determination as to how many identify some of these homeowners that might be willing to do it and try and get a deal done. It's a Board of Selectmen decision. And that and it would be enacted in ordinance or special? No, it, it, no it would be on a case-by-case -case basis. The Board of Selectmen, it could be an ordinance, Sheila, but it also could be a case-by-case -case basis with the Board of Selectmen. Uh, just like we offer incentives uh, to, uh, to 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 people before planning and zoning commission to do certain things, we can offer an incentive to have need restricted housing. Oh, so it doesn't have to be a, a sort of blanket ordinance because we do have the elderly tax stabilization that sort of thing in in ordinance, right? It could be an ordinance, but it doesn't have to. Be. <laughs> okay, thank you. And Jerry, where does for affordable housing to be rental housing? That you're renting yeah. that seems to me to be a little bit different than owning in the sense of how you write a deed restriction i maybe i'm wrong but no. what is what is it what is the qualification for affordable rental uh, uh, let's see I, I wish i have it and i don't have it handy but it, again it, it's based on median income and and what uh, the um let's see, hold on. I just don't, I'll get that for you because I looked at it yesterday and I don't have it in front of me, but I will get it. It is different than ownership, yeah. but it is based on the same kind of an affordable, how much uh, how much income is beyond what is necessary for a family to live on comfortably and how much can they allocate for housing within their income restriction. It, it, may, be in the, it may be in the housing committee survey, but it seems to me that a lot of the people who own affordable, naturally affordable housing are holding those as rental units and they don't ever plan to sell them because they're just getting the rental income. So they would have to actually modify not only the deed, but the rental, you know, the rentals would have to fall into that category that's defined in the law. If, if it were to become, if we were to incentivize those people owning rental units that have no intention of ever selling them, 
it would be that would be what we'd have to be facing. Right. Correct. And I'll yeah. get you the numbers, David. Yeah. Yeah. But the, the other issue, David, to you know, to further your point is that there is supplemental funding um, under the Section 8 guidelines to make up the difference between what people are able to pay and what the affordable rent, you know, is pegged at. So if the affordable rent is say $1,200 a month, which I think is probably about it, and the the 30 percent of the individual's income is say 800 a month, then that 400 will be made up by the um, either the state or the federal government. I'm not sure which it is under the under the um, Section 8 guidelines. So, you know, that's another thing to look at in terms of income. Correct me if I'm wrong, Jerry, but I think that's the way it works. Could be, yes, could be. Yeah. And, and and don't um. Don't uh, uh, kill the messenger here, but I'm just, I mean, just want to say one thing. I'm, uh, I, I know what the reaction is going to be. All these things are very good hypothetical situations that could fall into place, and they could happen over a period, but they also could not happen. That's why many towns are looking at their publicly owned properties where they know they can make something happen. And I'm not saying this based on the Woodbridge Country Club, the Country Club of Woodville. I'm not saying for any public property. But the only thing some towns know that they can control and further the affordable housing uh, goals of its town is to take a careful look at its publicly owned properties because that's where they know they can get something done. Again, I'm not saying the kind, I'm just saying all the things you just raised are very good points and they're in the statute, but we don't know if they're ever going to come to fruition. Oh. And we really have, uh, have the burden now of really trying to do something soon. And what can we control? So I'm just throwing that out for, to you, just as a right. just uh, an aside. Yeah. Well, it does seem I like think you. I think you were right with your first characterization. We'll kill the messenger, but you know, things happen if you want to make them happen. If you don't want to make them happen, they don't. So if this is the goal, you know, to make make affordable housing um, a priority for the town and not make the country club priority for affordable housing. You know, we should work towards that rather than throw up our hands and say, this will never happen. Let's just sell the country club for affordable housing and be done with it. I, I mean, that's, that's where I would leave it. Um, but you know, that, that's your opinion, but I, I don't think that is the way we should be going. Fair enough. Fair enough. Okay. And the Fitz, the Fitzgerald track would also qualify as a possible site for affordable housing in properties that are owned by the town. I saw that. Yep. We'll talk about that in a couple of weeks. Okay. I, saw that, I said that in there. I saw that in their proposal. Thank you, Jerry. That was very informative. Um, appreciate Can we get to the next section very quickly before they yes, kill us? Okay. Um, so I just want to keep, uh, bring something up and I had uh, Beth put this on the agenda and that is the um, 60 Woodfield Road property. And this is going to be very quick, and it's only for informational, no action now, but I just want you to be aware of, of an issue that has come up over the last couple of months. And it's a piece of property that is right adjacent to the Country Club of Woodbridge. It's a house. And at the time the town purchased the Country Club of Woodbridge, uh, there was a house on a, on a lot next to it that the uh, seller, the former uh, Woodbridge Country Club owners, um, uh, split off from the town's property and sold that piece of property separately to a private purchaser. So all these years, there was a fellow, I think it's a couple of owners of that property that have, that have been uh, owners. I think it's currently leased now by the owner. The owner has is, is interested in selling it. And lo and behold, the owner de determined that his property, when the line was, when the split was made by the Woodbridge Country Club um, sellers, and when they sold us our piece, our 150 acres, they also sold approximately two or three acres. I forget how much it is to this uh, this neighbor. And the line that was drawn to split the property included a portion of the deck, the concrete deck of the town pool, of the pool at the Country Club, which is on the our neighbor's property. In other words, they split the line in the wrong spot. It should have been close <coughs> to the neighbor's house. So that portion of that concrete deck uh, was on our property. Now it turns out it's on the neighbor's property. I don't think it's a big portion, although I don't have the exact square footage of how much is involved. The neighbor cannot sell his property because the title company says 
there's an encroachment on your property by the uh, by the town of this piece of concrete that goes over your line. <clears throat> he never realized it. it. It used to be our property. So when we built the, that concrete deck for the pool, it was on our property. The the um, uh, the the country club when they sold it to us just put the line in the wrong spot. It wasn't picked up by the purchaser of uh, 60 Woodfield. And now approximately nine, 10 years later, it's a problem. So we've been talking to his, his title company has been talking to the town, to me, and we're trying to come to some resolution of how we can fix this. Not a major problem, but it is a problem. And we will uh, hopefully come up with some creative way how to satisfy everybody um, and get this thing done. So just informational pur pur purposes, and I wanted the board to, to be aware of it, not grow by surprise. So that's that. And that's all I have, Beth, under my report, except for an executive session. I have a question on that. Um, wasn't that property surveyed before it was split off? It was surveyed, David, and, and I guess people did not pay attention to this. I don't know what happened. I don't know why it why that happened, but it probably should have been picked up by the um, by the um, by the purchaser of 60 Woodfield. I don't know whether it was picked up by the town when it purchased its property. I, I did not represent the town at the time. Um, so I, I think it was just overlooked by by everyone. And as far as the town is concerned, it's not a real problem for us. We encroach on that property, but it's not a typical encroachment because we never put that encroachment there. It was done at the time we own that, that property next door. So doesn't the um, doesn't the surveyor certify that that's an accurate survey and um, and don't they bear some uh, responsibility for that? I think the survey is certified that it was an accurate survey, but it didn't probably put the uh, the the encroachment on it. It probably missed the actual uh, concrete that goes over onto the neighbor's property. I, I don't know uh -huh. what happened. Uh, th again, this is not going to cost us any money. This is something that we're, we're here to, to try and help out a neighbor who needs some some relief to sell his property. Sell his property, right. So, so we, we I suggested perhaps the neighbor can deed us a small strip of land mm -hmm. lose that encroachment. Right. We would have a little more property, would get the encroachment off his land, and everybody could be well, happy. That's a simple solution. Okay. That's a simple, yeah. a simple people only want simple solutions. So mm -hmm. that works. hopefully that works. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. With that, we will move on to the final item on our agenda, which is an executive session. I will move that we enter executive session pursuant to section 1-206C of the Connecticut General Statutes uh, to discuss security devices related to dispatch and invite in uh, Tony Genovese and Jerry Weiner and also enter an executive session section 1-206B210B4 for discussion of a settlement related to 47 Pease Road. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Any discussion on the motion? Hearing none, I will move. Uh, I'm sorry, Joe Crisco? Aye. Beth Heller, aye. Paul Curie opposed? Paul? Sorry, I was on mute again. Aye. Uh, David Lober? Aye. Um, Sheila McCreven? Aye. Thank you. And uh, David Vogel? Aye. Thank you very much. And with that, we will. Um, release the folks that don't have to be here. And once we see their cameras disappear,